Hey everybody, it's Drags, and this week on Red Sox Beat, I welcome in Jason Mastrodonato, covering the Red Sox, doing a bang-up job for the Boston Herald. Follow him on Twitter at jmastrodonato, all one word. How you been, Jason? Hey, I've been great, Drags. It's good to hear your voice and talk some Red Sox with you. I appreciate that. It's been a great season. Uh, the Red Sox certainly have gotten back on the rails after uh, last year, and uh, Heim Bloom has really uh, pulled, pushed all the right buttons, and I think a big part of this, and everybody that I've had on in the last several weeks, from Ian Brown to Rob Bradford to Jen McCaffrey, have all touched on the fact that getting Alex Cora back uh, in that dugout seat after he accepted responsibility of what happened uh, down in Houston, what happened in 2018, getting him back in the dugout has been one of the big keys. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is. And it was like, you know, I think maybe five people in Boston were surprised that, that Alex Cora came back. It was like, you know, the, the worst kept secret in, in Boston sports was that he was coming back. And you kind of even got the sense uh, when they let him go, like in that press conference where they said goodbye. I remember asking Sam Kennedy, I said, do you think Alex deserves a second chance one day? And he said, yep, after, a, you know, he'll, he'll have a rehab process and then it's time and then I'm sure he'll get another chance and it was like all along you kind of felt it and then I remember you know the players kind of pining for Ron Renneke and, and saying we want Ron Renneke because this constitutes um continue uh, kind of continuating the Alex Cora experience right. of, of just keeping that going and um continuating I just made up a word um works for me works on PLNF <laughs> Media's podcast so it, it was you know, I, I think we all expected Alex Cora to come back. I'm not sure we expected him to take the same team that was kind of awful to watch last year, albeit a couple added pieces. But really, I, I think 80% of this pitching staff was on the team last year. And it was like one of the worst pitching staffs I've ever seen in baseball in like my brutal. decade. It was bad. But it was I've also never seen it. Rip. it was. It was. They had a lot of injuries, but high and bloom kind of, you know, didn't add a whole lot to the pitching staff this year, right? I mean, Garrett Richards is a new guy. You got Darwin and Hernandez and Josh Taylor back, but a lot of these guys were here last year and just underperforming. And so, you know, I always said, I think Alex Cora is a better manager of pitchers than he is position players, even though he was a position player. That is seems, kind of interesting. Why? He, he seems to have a good understanding of pitcher strengths and how to get the best out of his guys. Like, Hey, you know, Josh Taylor, you're, this, slider you have is really working can we throw it more often than you used to throw it can we throw it in, uh you know can we throw your left-handed change up to left-handed hitters or, or can we tinker with your stuff um and make it so that you're having more success and I, Cora just sees the, the game really well as we know he's a great manager of people but he's also a really good strategic manager when it comes to pitching attack plans and I think we're seeing that uh with a lot of the pitchers this year Oh, there's no question about that. And look, I've felt all along with the Red Sox, they were going to hit. That's no secret. I mean, their lineup, the, the big four to me, starting the season in, in terms of Devers, Bogey, J.D., and Verdugo really did their job. But now you have a guy like Hunter Renfro. And I want to spend some time on Hunter Renfro and why, to me, he has been offensively been the linchpin of this team and why they are – 48 and 31. They're a game ahead of Tampa Bay as we record this uh, in the ALEs. He has been a huge part, not only offensively, but in the field. He has. And, and I got to say, he's one of the guys I, I was wrong about. You know, when they started using him alone. in April. What's that? I said you weren't alone in that. There were a lot of people thinking, what has Hunter Renfro ever done? And what, what will he actually be able to bring to the Red Sox? Exactly. I mean, you look at him, he's always been fantastic in, against lefties, right? His entire career, he crushes lefties, but he's a platoon player. That's why you have him in there against lefties. That's what he does. This year, 347 average, 1,078 OPS against lefties. I mean, he destroys them. The problem is he's always been bad against right-handed pitching. And my argument against Hunter Renfro getting playing time was you have Jaron Duran in AAA, who's a left-handed hitter who has, by all accounts, gotten a lot better on defense, um, who's destroying the ball. I think he's got 12 homers in 32 games. Um, and he could be a perfect platoon partner with Hunter Renfro or just move things around so that Renfro is not really playing against a lot of right-handed pitchers. Well, I didn't realize how good Hunter Renfro was on defense. 
I mean, he's been so good. I think he leads the majors with 11 outfield assists. Yes, I was going to say his arm has not only been strong, it's been accurate. And to me, look, I mean, there have been so many great outfielders over the year in, in right field who have a gun, a cannon for an arm, but they're not accurate. His arm has been very accurate. It has been. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, Jackie Bradley Jr. comes to mind, right? I mean, could throw a million miles an hour, but how often did the throw end up up the third baseline? And Well, a never JBJ had a play strength, play. you know this, Jason. JBJ, his real strength was run prevention. He could right. cover as much ground in center field as any outfielder, center fielder I've ever seen at Fenway. And that includes Fred Lynn. That includes anybody you want to name, Mookie, uh, whoever the Red Sox have had in that outfield. I've never seen a player covers as much territory as JBJ. And when he left, look, he wasn't going to, you know, put the light the world on fire with his bat, but he, I wondered how the Red Sox were going to replace him defensively and they haven't missed a beat. No, I, exactly. And, you know, I think a lot of that is just how good Renfro has been in right field. And we know right field in Fenway is maybe as a center fielder. Exactly. Maybe equally as important in center, as the center field, but yeah, because his defense is so good, I think it's justified allow, to allow Alex Cora to play him against right-handed pitching because his numbers still aren't that good. He's hitting 240 with a 677 OPS against right-handed pitching. So that's a well below average OPS against right-handed pitching, and they keep playing him every day. And I understand they think he's their best option and he helps them with defense. I still think you can make the argument that he should probably not be playing as often as he has against right-handed pitching. But – they found a nice little left-right situation in the lineup where he protects Devers. If they want to bring in a left a left-hander to face Devers, well, you know, with the three batter rule, guess what? You're going to face Hunter Renfro next, and he's one of the best in the game against lefties. So I I, I understand it more than I thought I would. I think there's something to be said for the consistency in the outfield and the consistency uh, defensively to put the same lineup out there every night. I think that's a bigger factor in Alex Cora's. Uh, run prevention philosophy in, in the outfield than it is the right left matchup at the plate. I really do. And especially, yeah. especially, let, let, let me just make this quick point, especially when you have a pitching staff that gives up a, a lot of fly balls and B um, is still let's, uh, bring this up here. Their uh, pitching staff has one picture under four in the ERA. And that's Nathan Evaldi. It's 367. You have Garrett Richards at 496. Nick Pavetta at four, uh, Eddie uh, Erod is at 583, and Martin Perez at 409. They're all four or higher, so run, pre run prevention. Is a big, big deal. Yep, no, you're absolutely right. Run prevention and then the consistency of the lineup. And I think that's when you ask me or people ask me, like, how do you think Cora has changed in his managerial style? I think there's a few ways, but one of them is he's understood the importance of consistency where he used to shuffle around his lineup all the time. His pitchers didn't have roles. It was like Matt Barnes is pitching the sixth inning tonight. He's pitching the ninth inning tomorrow. And I think he thought that players can just move around a little bit like, you know, robots. Like it wasn't going to affect them if they were pitching in the fifth or the ninth. Well, why should it? It's the same game. We're still playing baseball. Or if you hit the second today and seventh tomorrow, who cares? You're still playing baseball. And I think, he's learned that players really like consistency. They like knowing exactly where they're going to be in the lineup and what inning they're going to pitch. And I think you're, you're seeing that this year where he's got two through six in the lineup doesn't change. And well, let, it, <clears throat> go ahead. No. Yeah. Same thing with the relievers. You know, he knows exactly Matt Barnes knows he's pitching the ninth and out of Eno's pitching the eighth. And these guys know exactly where they're going to play. And I think they appreciate that. So um, on Monday night, Hunter Renfro, since we're speaking of him, had two home runs, but that doesn't do it justice. They were mammoth, mammoth shots. And you know, in this stat cast era, when we're measuring everything, spin rates, uh, projected distances, barreling up of, of pitches, Hunter Renfro, that's what it, it shows me that, you know, he hit home runs, let's see, of um, 439 feet in the fourth inning and 434 feet in the sixth inning. That means he's barreling up the ball. He's crushing it. I, you know, and I just pulled up his numbers too, to just look at it. I mean, his maximum eg exit velocity is in the 94th percentile uh, average eg exit velocity in the 77th percentile. I mean, the guy destroys the ball. There's no question. Yeah. And that's, that's why the Red Sox brought him here. It's just crazy to me that the Tampa Bay Rays who are like 
you know, more into this stuff than any team, it seems. Right. DFA'd this guy in November. And it's like, I don't, I, that's, that's another reason where the Tampa Bay Rays don't want the guy who's got one of the hardest exit losses in baseball. He and was $3 million. Like lost him that much. I mean, he's yeah. not going to break the bank there. Right. He was arbitration eligible still. And they said, forget it. We don't even want to pay him the, the $3 million, whatever he's going to get. And the Red Sox said, we'll take him at $3 million. So hit lefties. Again, I didn't think he was going to play this much against right-handers, but Hey, if he's playing, like you said, if he's playing great defense, he's still hitting the ball hard. You know, the numbers don't look great against righties right now, but he's doing other things and you can justify having him in the lineup every day. Arguably and understandably, uh, Hein Bloom's best move of the offseason, one of his best moves of the offseason. He really, he knew what Hunter Renfro was. He's familiar with the player, obviously. And, you know, that's where it, it does, I think, pay off to have a, a younger um, mind in there like Heim Bloom, who's willing to bring in some pieces to kind of, if you want to use the term band-aid, do that band-aid and then de- restock the, the farm system. And that is, has been one of his charges from John Henry on down in terms of the ownership group and Sam Kennedy. We've got to restock the farm system. Um, one other player that I think is coming on and I want to touch on real quick here, Jason, is Bobby Dahlbeck. He did not get off to a great start. And there have been other players early in their career. Dustin Pedroia, since he was honored uh, this week uh, in the Red Sox Hall of Fame, he did not get off to a very good start in 2006. You remember the first month of the season, what he did? He hit like, uh, what was it, uh, 183 or something like that. It's so important for a guy that you believe in, give him the reps. Don't yank him out of the lineup and and give Alex Cora a lot of credit, give Hein Bloom, a lot of credit. I'm sure both of them have talked about Dahlbeck at length. They did not give up on him. We're going to keep him in the lineup, and we have enough around him to let him find his footing, and I think he's done that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think he's gotten better. You know, I still think there's so much work to do here with Dahlbeck. I mean, he reminds me a lot of Renfro, actually. You know, hits the ball really hard when he makes contact, really good against lefties, not hitting righties at all this year, really been awful against right handers hitters he's got 57 strikeouts and 136 at bats against righty so he's striking out almost half the time against righties it's just hard to it's it's hard to earn your way in the lineup but you're right they've trusted this kid because they they believe in his potential um and he's played a pretty good first base i think and he's handled lefties so well and it's like who else are you going to put in there you're not going to call up tristan casas yet he's still got to develop in double a although you can sure you can make the argument the way teams call up young kids now that you know, Casas could come up and play, but Dahlbeck, you got to see what you got in Bobby Dahlbeck. And he had the great short season last year. Um, He had the great spring training. I completely understand why they've kept him in the lineup. I thought it was hard to justify earlier on when they were struggling offensively a little bit here and there, they would hit spurts where it was like, ah, when you're struggling offensively and you got a guy going over four with four strikeouts every day, it's, it's tough to keep him in the lineup, but they've showed a lot of faith in him. And you know, I still don't know if he's going to be the guy. I think we got another month or so before the trade deadline here. And, and I, I'm sure that Hyam Bloom will be looking at first baseman and saying, is there any way we can help? Can we find a platoon partner, a Mitch Moreland, somebody who hits left-handed to play with Dahlbeck over at first base? But um, he's certainly been better than he was early in the season. More to the point, I think they are, I think, exposing him and putting him out there to see if other teams might be interested and if he could be a chip of a uh, – package or a piece of a package mm. to bring in picture because mm. I've said all along and we'll get to more of this in, in just a minute but is the Red Sox pitching their rotation good enough even if Chris Sale comes back and I'm just not bought in I know what their record is it's 48 and 31 I'm almost you know lock stock and barrel confident that they are going to be a playoff team but the pitching staff the starting rotation I'm still not sold on it. I'm, I'm with you. That's an interesting point about trading Dahlbeck for pitching. I never thought about that, but that actually makes a lot of sense when you think about Casas coming up soon and they've right. been using Michael Chavis at first base some, and, and they can certainly get by. And it seems like a position there's always guys available to trade in line. I mean, they just traded one last year in Moreland uh, who would actually be perfect uh, for this team, a, a Moreland like player, but that's a great point about trading Dahlbeck for some pitching. They're going to have to do something because We've seen it where, you know, they have one day 
where, you know, Garrett Richards goes one inning and they're done. The bullpen is messed up for a week. They just don't have the depth. Um, and that's know, Madden, what you saw in the Tampa Bay. Well, you saw it in, in game two, I believe it was, of the Tampa Bay series. You saw it in game one also. Uh, but they managed to, you know, win that incredibly bizarre game. And then there was, a, you know, a, obviously a pitcher's duel in the third game. But that, to me, that Tampa Bay series, I think, exposed the Red Sox needs coming up to the trade deadline. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Trags. And and it's I don't think it has to be a starter, it has to be a reliever. I think it could they could go a lot of ways here. They just need they just need a little bit of help. And you know, the big factor here is they lost Brian Mata and they lost Thad Ward to season ending Tommy John surgery. And these guys were supposed to be the sixth, seventh, eighth starters for them. And you need those guys during the season. And they they haven't had that. You know, Tanner Houck got injured. Um, I think Tanner Houck's incredible. I still thought it was it was kind of a disservice to him to be shuttling him back and forth early, early in the season after what he did last year and even in his first few appearances this year I thought this guy's a big leaguer who should be in the big leagues but then he ends up getting hurt too they really need Tanner Houck back that could be a really good midseason acquisition Chris Sale but they're probably going to have to get somebody and it can't just be well we'll trade cash for Yaxel Rios and and hope for the best I mean they're going to have to get somebody who's a legitimate force either in the bullpen or a guy who can patch up the rotation, push someone else to the bullpen. They're going to need a real arm, I think. Speaking with Jason Mastrodonato, covering the Boston Red Sox for the Boston Herald. Chris Sale. I don't know how much they are going to be relying on Chris Sale. I don't know if he's going to be back at the end of the end of July, early August. Is he the piece that they think is going to act like a trade? Uh, late season trade and add some value and depth to the starting rotation. They, I mean, it certainly seems like they think that doesn't it? I mean, for a while it was like, well, we don't know. We're taking our time. We're, you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves I, here. I understand that. Of course. And then all of a sudden, like three weeks ago, the attitude changed. You got high and bloom going on Nesson pregame show saying this is the best we've ever seen him. He looks fantastic. We're so excited right now. This is amazing. Mm. And, and you got Alex Cora saying, what a day. I mean, we're all watching. This is like, it's so hard not to get our, uh, ahead of ourselves here. Something happened a few weeks ago where they just started getting, they, their tune completely changed from we have to be safe and careful to, oh my God, he's looking so good and we can't wait to get him back. And, you know, you wonder if with trade season coming up, is it just yep. like, hey, you know, let's, let's make it seem like we don't need pitching that badly. Correct. Uh, so there could be some of that. Um, I think there's also some of, trying to motivate the team like hey guys keep it up we got one of the best pitchers in the planet is coming back soon so just hang in there you know they're going through a rough stretch for a little while just hang in there we got Chris Sale coming back let's let's bring him to Fenway and have him throw a bullpen session and have the whole team watch and get excited and you know I think they're they're using him even if he doesn't pitch they're using him to kind of manipulate attitudes or trade markets oh, they're, 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 they're using him so they're doing something with him. And, and I do think he's going to help them at some point this year. I think you look what happened to Noah Syndergaard and Luis Severino. They both had Tommy John around the same time Sale did. They were both way ahead of sale schedule because Sale had a couple setbacks. He had COVID. He had a neck injury. I think he had some shoulder soreness. I can't remember what it was in, in spring training that they later revealed. Uh, and now what happened? Syndergaard's probably not going to pitch this year. Severino got hurt in his second rehab start. Um, so this Red Sox kind of look like geniuses now taking it nice and slow with Chris sale used to be like a 12 month, 11, sometimes 11 month recovery period. Now we're on to 15 months. He's still not making rehab starts yet. So they're taking their sweet time with Chris sale. And, um, I think they're hoping it pays dividends later in the year, but we'll see. I'm a 76 er fan. And after watching, um, from here in Cincinnati, watching that series against Atlanta and watching Doc Rivers, the best, I hate to use this term, snake oil salesman I've ever seen in, in, in coaching, come to Ben's defense, you know, two days later and say, we believe uh, that he can be a big part of our future, he may not be a point guard, but we're going to put the work in with Ben when everybody and their brother assumes that Ben Simmons is gone, he's not going <laughs> to stay with the Sixers, right? Um, that's kind of how I feel like Alex Cora can pull off a Doc Rivers a little bit sometimes. Yeah. He's totally capable of, of putting a spin on a player in one regard, in one way, to uh, you know, serve another purpose in, an, in another way. Absolutely. You're right. He's one of the best 
manipulators of the narrative that I've seen in uh, in my 10 years covering baseball. He's really good at shaping the narrative. I mean, you look, they lose the race series and it was like a heartbreaking loss on a wild pitch with two outs in the ninth against the worst hitter in the lineup. All Matt Barnes had to do was, was throw two more strikes and the inning was over. And he spikes one in the dirt. It gets away. They lose the game. They lose the series. Huge series. Devastating. And Alex Cora comes out. Hey, how devastating was that loss? His first answer is, I'm so proud of our team. We played amazing. We proved that we compete with anybody. Nobody believed in us. And we came out here and competed with the Rays for three games. It's like, no, you just lost a devastating game, a huge series. And he's manipulating the narrative and kind of putting this positive spin on it. And I think whether or not we buy it in the media, whether or not the fans buy it really doesn't matter. If his players buy it, that's what matters. And I think they buy it. They buy what he's selling. I have no problem with that at all either. I understand what Alex Gore was doing after that one nothing loss uh, on the wild pitch by Barnes. And I think that's part of his job. And he's great at it. It's, and that's why the Red Sox management and ownership loves him because he is capable of manipulating the narrative and all and and having a found uh, a very sound fundamental understanding of of baseball concepts at the same time and i think that's really what they're looking for with alex cora the team is never after a really difficult you want to call it devastating loss like the one nothing loss to tampa um he's not going to let the team get down on itself ever yep yep he's very good at that and uh, I want to ask you about another picture we touched on, Matt Barnes. He has had statistically a very good first half of 2021. And he's going to be a big part of what they hope to accomplish in the second half. And, you know, we assume getting to the, they're going to get to the playoffs, what they're going to do in the playoffs. Do you believe in him at the back end of the bullpen in playoff games? Ooh, man. That's a tough one. You know, I, I don't know that I'd bet a whole lot of money on it, but he's, he's looked incredible this year. The, you know, the, the tough thing about Barnes is this is his eighth year in the big leagues. And until this year, it was always the same thing. It was great pitcher. Doesn't want the ninth, you know, do, he, he just doesn't want the ninth inning. I remember John Farrell didn't want to put him in the ninth inning uh, for whatever reason. Matt Barnes didn't want the ninth and they didn't trust him in the ninth. And obviously this year we're seeing something totally different. I mean, the guys come alive in the ninth inning. He's something's something happened here. I, you know, and there's a lot of stories about him showing up to camp and saying, I want the, I want the ball in the ninth skip, give it to me. Adam out saying, you take it. Uh, I believe in you, even though out has got a, a better track record than Barnes and had some more closing experience than he did. Um, something happened with Barnes this year where his attitude is just totally different. So it's so hard to know, is he the guy in the first seven years of his career who would get a little nervous, who'd come in and walk the leadoff guy uh, who other managers didn't want to use in the ninth inning? Or, or is he this new guy? Is this who he is now? And he's playing for a contract and he's motivated and he's like, give it to me. I want, I want to be the guy. So it's really, I have a hard time saying when it get, comes to the playoffs, this guy's going to be locked, locked down, slamming the door every night um, just because we know his history a little bit. Uh, but it's really been fun to watch how good he's been this year. He has been really, really good. And, you know, that kind of leads us to uh, the next subject, and that is the, the Red Sox competition, the true competition in the American League. It's going to be Tampa Bay in their own division, the White Sox, the Astros, and the A's, right? I mean, do you, maybe the yeah. Indians, if they get hot at the end of the season, but that's it. That's all you're, you're talking about in the American League. It's really not a great – league and it, it's kind of interesting i thought it'd be better i thought the yankees would be better obviously i i still think the blue jays are pretty good i wouldn't i wouldn't want them to get hot and if they went up and made a a key trade deadline acquisition i think the blue jays can can be kind of sneaky good as well um but you're right there's not a ton of competition i think if they could kind of build any separation from tampa and just make their their september a little bit easier I think that'd do them a world of good going into the playoffs. It's just, you don't want to end up in a situation where it's a, a dog fight right until the final game and you're, you're burning everyone and your pitchers are burned out. And, you know, it was a short season last year. We don't know how many innings guys can throw. And now you're pushing everyone to the edge in September. I think that's going to be tough. You know, we talked about them not having a lot of pitching depth. That's where it really starts to show itself. I mean, 2011 wasn't that long ago when, 
when everybody was burned out at the end of the year, they had no more pitching and just completely fell apart. So that's where you talk about getting some pitching depth. They're going to need it in September because Tampa's not going to go away. Also, you know, and I've got, got my uh, handy dandy MLB.com uh, Red Sox schedule in, on my uh, smartphone here in front of me. And you take a look, the Red Sox finish up with three against Kansas City uh, this week. And then they head out on six games out to the West Coast that I think are going to be very interesting before three at home at three, three at Fenway with uh, the Phillies before the All-Star break. But the three against the A's on the road and the three against the Angels. To me, that's going to tell me a lot about where this team is heading into the all-star break and what they're going to need to do before the uh, trade deadline. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and we've seen them before go to the West Coast and just put up a stinker. It's like, it, it seems like for whatever reason, this team over the last few years, when they go to the West Coast, has some trouble. And they're just looking to split series and and, and just – you know, in these if they had six games on the road, if they win three of them, I think they'll be happy. That's just the way they've played on the West Coast the last few years. And Oakland's a great team. You know, the Angels are okay. Uh, they've already seen what Shohei can do. So um, that it, you're right, though. That's a huge series right before the All Star break, right before Hyam Bloom gets on the phone and and maybe starts making some trades. That that could tell them a lot. And then uh, after the All Star break uh, comes a huge stretch uh, against the AL East. The Yankees for four at Yankee Stadium, three against Toronto, um, we assume in Buffalo, right? Uh, four against the Yankees at Fenway, and then four more at home against Toronto. And then three on a weekend series at, right around the trade deadline at Tampa Bay. Two weeks straight against divisional opponents. I mean, that's crazy. That, that's, a, <laughs> that's a heck of a schedule. Uh, right. Hopefully for them, the Yankees are still playing like garbage and, and haven't figured it out. I mean, Garrett Cole, it's really remarkable. Uh, to see Garrett Cole struggle the way he is. I mean, $325 million could be uh, seriously in jeopardy with, with the new rules and, and how much Garrett Cole is struggling. So that kind of takes the Yankees probably, like I said, I think the, the Blue Jays are scarier to me. You know, the Blue Jays, I can't – what's George Springer's status? I don't remember. but No, uh, he's uh, supposed to come back, I believe, uh, by, by the trade deadline, like right around that weekend. Yep. So if they get George Springer back – this is a good team. This is a good team. We see, we saw Vlad carry them against the Red Sox a little bit. Um, the, the Blue Jays are scary. That's going to be a really tough stretch. And again, with that, that coming right up against the August 1st, July 31st timetable right there, it's that, that could be telling. Do we have enough pitching? Who are we going to get? Do we need to go after somebody really good? Can we just get you know, a back end arm? What do we need here? Uh, it's going to be a really telling month. For this team and it's going to be interesting to see what high bloom does this is his first trade deadline where he's buying uh he was selling last year hasn't been super aggressive when he goes out and makes moves they're mostly kind of smaller names second third tier guys uh so this is going to be a, a fascinating month for the red sox the, uh, toronto is going to come down to the top three of their uh rotation in jin ru uh robbie ray and um alec manoa carrying them and yeah. the Manoa uh, is interesting because he's what, 23 years of age. I uh, made his debut already um, this year. He's had six starts. He's looked pretty sensational. So uh, yes. I, I think, you know, does Toronto's pick, do they have enough pitching? Cause I think their lineup is, they have some players in that lineup that are just in, uh, beyond, beyond Vladimir Guerrero Jr. They have Bo oh, Bichette. Yeah. They have Kevin Biggio. We've seen what they can do. Randall Grychuk. Um, one of my favorite players in that lineup, always to watch. He's the Red Sox killer. You know who I'm talking about. T. Oscar? Uh, or no. Rowdy, Rowdy Telez. <laughs> he is, I still think, uh, Jason, I don't know if you remember the home run. It was early, I think, in 2019. Uh, he hit a home run to the deepest part of the grandstand seats. Yeah, it came within feet of hitting off the uh, facade, off the retired numbers. That is the longest home run I've seen by a left-handed batter at Fenway. I, and I, I've seen some other bombs that have been hit there, but that home run had to have been at least 475, 480 feet. Oh, my God. It, it is crazy how good this guy is against the Red Sox. Every time he plays the Red Sox, it's like, Look out, man. He's got 37 career home runs, 12 of them against the Red Sox. Is that uh, right? Yeah. 
it, it, it's it's insane how well he's played against that team and, and not not that good against anybody else. No, as um, a 209 average, he's slashing 209, 272, 338. That would indicate that. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jason very much he's only got four homers this year eight RBIs and um, you know he's on the injured list now that's one of the reasons for that but um, still um, you know he is somebody that has always been a Red Sox killer but the the, the Blue Jays are the wild card I think in, in the AL East I still think though it's going to be a two-team race coming down the stretch I think the Red Sox uh, we started off this podcast talking about the job Heim Bloom and Alex Gore have done in terms of developing uh, the depth, I think they've got great depth, and uh, I think they're going to, you know, approach 100 wins again, the, the way they're going right now, barring injury. Yeah, we'll see. The pitching depth still scares me. That's why I had them, uh, I think I had them finishing in fourth place when I did my preseason rankings, um, because I just didn't believe in the pitching. I mean, obviously, it's been much better than we could have anticipated, but I, I'm still scared by the depth. I mean, they're one injury away from from really having some problems, because they just don't have anyone in AAA who could help them. Uh, but yes, uh, they, they certainly have the top end talent to win this division. No question. Anything else on your mind? Oh, it's a hundred degrees in Boston today. I'm just, uh, it's just pretty warm. Yeah. It should be an interesting game. And we saw Garrett Richards putting his arm in ice last night in the middle of, <laughs> in the middle of the game to stop himself from sweating. Um, so we'll, crazy things seem to ha- happen at Fenway when it's this hot. And the ball certainly flies as we uh, saw from the two home runs. Uh, that we mentioned from Hunter Renfro. They were tape measured shots and certainly in the heat, it doesn't uh, hold those balls uh, back at all. Yep, exactly. Well, it's been good catching up with you, Jason. Uh, we got to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, looking forward to listening to the podcast and it's always good to chat with you, Trax. Yeah, we'll have to catch up on Nick Castellano. See, uh, he had quite the game for the Red Legs last night. Uh, Grand Slam, seven RBIs. I think he's wow. the National League MVP right now. Wow. I, know, I don't. I I don't vote pitching uh, for yeah. MVP. I everybody's coming at me on Twitter with Jacob Degrom, and I get it. Yeah. But um, Nick Castellanos is the best day to day player I've seen in the National League. This wow! Year. I didn't realize he was hitting three forty seven. My goodness, one hundred seventy four yeah. total bases. Wow! His OPS. His OPS at home at Great American this year is 13-10. Well, it's like the Coors Field effect. Is he going to win the MVP with a 13-10 OPS at Great American? That's actually a great point. I'm going to have to – actually, next week I have um, the one and only John Sadak, the Reds play-by-play voice on Red Sox beat. We're going to talk a little – uh, minor league baseball. We're going to talk a lot about um, how he approached. He's got, he's got a very unique way of approaching uh, baseball broadcasting. I call him TR Sadak, Total Recall. He he does a game with statistics that I've never heard before. It's just unbelievable. Amazing. So that'll be next week. All right. All right, Jason. Thanks so much for joining us. It has been a pleasure catching up with you. We will do it again. No doubt about that. I want to thank everybody for downloading today's podcast. Thank our terrific guest, the one and only Jason Mastrodonato from the Boston Herald covering the Red Sox all year long. Follow him on Twitter at jmastrodonato, all one word. I'm Mike Petralia, and for Jason Mastrodonato, this has been the Red Sox Beat Podcast powered by CLNS Media.